Thank you very much. Now let's uh, let's crack into the session. Um, my name is Matthew Cutler Welsh. I'm the uh, education manager for ProClimber here in New Zealand and also uh, Australia as well. Uh, basically, that means that I uh, coordinate some of the the training activities. Uh, I do present uh, some presentations on um, some of the the topics, but uh, where possible. I get people who are far smarter than me to um, present. And this is one of those cases where I'm talking about Woofie today, but we actually get Jesse Clark, who is the Woofie guru. He's based in Sydney and he actually uh, takes the Woofie training. So um, that's what we're gonna be talking about today. All right, so uh, during this session, I'm gonna give a bit of a, a run through of a hydrothermal modeling in uh, a basic. So we're going to get we're going to go into a little bit of the the building science, uh, and then I'm going to talk about what um, Woofy specifically does and how you might be able to use it. Now, one of the things I um, say about Woofy and and we've basically got three levels of, of training that we offer at the First level, it's an introduction to Woofy, and one of the most important things I think at that level is knowing what questions to ask of the software and how to interpret the the answers. And so that our fundamentals course is really pitched at those people who might be designing buildings, they want some information on how the facade is gonna perform or how the, the building envelope is gonna form. And it's enough knowledge to know the how to frame a question about moisture and the limitations of the software, some of the property materials that you might might need to do an accurate model, and then to basically get someone else to do that modeling for you. Once the modeling's done, then uh, you're gonna need to be able to interpret those results and say, well, what does this mean for this design? Is it gonna work, is it not? What are the risks? So it's worthwhile having a little bit of a, a play with Woofy to be able to have that level of understanding of what's it capable of, what can I actually ask of it, and a, uh, a professional. Then the second level is someone who might be interested in actually doing that modeling themselves. So we go into a little bit more practice uh, and also look at some of the extensions that are available for things like um, mold growth analysis or corrosion analysis. These are these are, um, plugins that you can have a look at. Um, and then we also, once or twice a year, we offer a an advanced course, which is looking at Woofy 2D. That's getting into some pretty complex um, modeling where you have uh, different junctions of buildings, requires a lot more processing power and uh, is fairly specialist. So we, we only really run that. Most of the modeling that, uh, most of the questions that get asked can be answered by uh, um, Woofy Pro. So let's uh, let's jump into it. So um, we've got woofy.co.nz and woofy.com.au. ProClima is the uh, cooperation partner for Woofy, which basically means that we have a relationship with Fraunhofer, where Woofy is developed in Germany. And we also coordinate with uh, brands and, and some of our friends at brands um, are quite involved with localization of the, the software. So things like climate files that they uh, make the Woofy software and the algorithms work in the New Zealand context. Let's start the story. We're gonna be talking about mold and the issues of condensation. So we just need to step back a little bit and say, you know, why are we interested in, in Woofy? So at, at its heart, Woofy is a set of tools that allows us to do hydrothermal modeling. Hydrothermal modeling is a combination of water, that's hydro, and thermal heat. So it's the heat and moisture transfer through buildings. And we are concerned about this because well, we know the damaging effects of 
um, moisture. Uh, these these uh, studies on the screen here are from Australia and basically addressing some of the, the issues that have, have arisen from leaky buildings. In New Zealand, there is a, an equal amount of um, bad media um, coverage, rightly so. Um, one of the most famous, of course, being the 2005, sorry, the um, the Hun report, uh, which was the big report that was done about uh, the underlying issues of leaky building of the leaky building crisis in New Zealand, as, as it became to known. Um, 2005 Brands report estimated that approximately 40,000 dwellings were at risk of some form of leaky buildings. I think that's been um, pretty well, well and truly eclipsed uh, that number now. Uh, PwC estimated uh, about 12,000 dwellings might fail uh, and have a, a repair cost of around a billion dollars. And uh, you, you see reports in the media on a pretty regular basis, particularly as we get now into autumn and we start get, the weather's getting cooler. It's not that hard to find more and more it, um, in, in just mainstream media about the problems associated with uh, water getting in to buildings, that's the leaky side of things, and also condensation on the inside. So those estimates of the cost of leaky buildings have well and truly uh, been um, e e eclipsed now. The, the cost has, has gone way above those initial estimates and it's a massive, massive problem and ongoing as well. So we need to be smarter about the way we design and build. We kind of know this already, um, particularly a lot of the people that are here today, pretty aware of these issues. Our challenge is to convince others that we need to uh, address these issues and that we have the tools to be able to do it. So let's look a little bit at the New Zealand context. Apologies here for Australians, but there are equivalents. Uh, well, in some in some sense there are equivalents. I know that there uh, there are some also some big holes in both of our. Uh, the both building code here in New Zealand and the National Construction Code, the NCC in Australia, doesn't fully address moisture uh, as as well as it should. Part of the um, of well, our observation with the building code is that the objectives are actually quite sound. So here we've got E2, which is we're pretty familiar with that. It's to do with external moisture, so this is stopping water from getting into buildings. And the objective is to safeguard people from illness or injury. And that's great. If our buildings actually achieve that, would be would be a really, really good result. Um, and there's also a note in there that we should uh, avoid the accumulation of moisture from the outside. Again, really great um, objective. When we come down to the performance, um, it gets quite wordy. Um, and with the, the challenge is actually the implementation of those and where that, where that gets into the um, acceptable solutions and then the actual, the, the design and construction. Uh, the de well, I don't know if, it's, if there's a debate really, but we often fail to actually meet those objectives. E3, again, most of the people on this call, I think, will be familiar with E3, but we have to remember that a lot of people aren't, and that includes a lot of building professionals, designers, building surveyors, well, building surveyors actually uh, probably do know a bit about E3, but a lot, it's very, very easy to ignore E3 in a lot of constructions because there's not a great requirement for it to be addressed. Again, the objectives of E3 uh, are very sound, the idea is to avoid the accumulation of internal moisture. So this is addressing any moisture that comes from the inside of the building that could affect the health, uh, but also the longevity of that building structure. Um, 
And it even addresses the fact that our buildings should be constructed to avoid the likelihood of growing mold. What it doesn't do though very well is talk about how this should be checked at design stage and then how it should be quantified or assessed during the construction and then there's no real accountability for the actual performance in the achieve, achievement of those objectives. All we are required to do as a designer is to provide adequate awareness of this and the clause actually goes on to define what adequate means by saying adequate means adequate which is not very helpful so that's the problem we have the objectives in the clause are i think pretty sound the wheels fall off a little bit when it comes to the implementation of those objectives when we look beyond New Zealand uh, and even within a lot of the standards in the building code we come across ASHRAE standards and for good reason ASHRAE is um, it's an American uh, association but they've done a, a, an incredible amount of work over a long period of time and they have developed very very good standards and it makes sense to adopt a lot of those standards which is what we've done to a certain extent um, so, um, IRA has uh, adopted or, or at least references a lot of uh, ASHRAE standards, um, particularly this one, ASHRAE 160. And one of the, the, the aspects that these types of standards and, and indeed our um, people who are interested in this space look at uh, are these issues of internal moisture so one of the big common problems is is condensation on cold surfaces one of the most likely being windows and this of course leads to mold when we get uh, an increased level of humidity in the air uh, or dampness on cold surfaces we've got plenty of food source for for mold in the in the cellulose materials that we use for a lot of our, our constructions so all they really need is a little bit of moisture it doesn't even have to be liquid moisture necessarily it can just be high levels of humidity and uh, we get uh, mold flourishing within our buildings now this is the this is the problem that people see and this is when it becomes pretty obvious because and, and the journalist turns up and their photographer takes all these photos of, of children's bedrooms with, with mold on the wall. In some ways, that's the least problem because it's obvious. It can be seen, it can be dealt with, it can be cleaned off. It's not ideal, definitely. But if a, if a building has surface mold on the inside like that, then we can be pretty sure that there's also mold growing inside the wall. And that's a bigger con concern because it's invisible, but still very, very dangerous. Because any mold that grows on the inside of a wall, when that building dries out a little bit in the summertime or um, when things dry off um, a little bit, then those spores can become airborne. Uh, if air has got into that wall, air can get out easily and bring those spores with it. And then that's when we, lead to some of those uh, sick building problems because our buildings literally make people sick. So we have to keep in mind that even if we can't see mold on the outside of our walls or on the inside of our walls, then we need to be sure that there's no mold growing on the uh, between the lining on the inside and, and the cladding on the outside. And the question is, how can we be sure of that? So this is part of what WUFI helps us to do with hydrothermal modeling. All right, so what we're seeing on the screen now, uh, down the bottom is the output of a WUFI simulation. So the WUFI software, I, <laughs> I have to uh, admit that it's not the prettiest software, um, but it is powerful. 
and that's really what we're after as engineers as designers we want something that's going to give us uh, some results so at the top uh, we've got two cases here shown we've got concrete a concrete wall with glass wall insulation in this case uh, as is common it's not necessarily a good idea but putting glass wool on the inside of concrete uh, with an air gap and then plasterboard lining on the inside. On the right hand side we've got the same system but over the top of the wool, the glass wool, we've got a vapour barrier. We'll briefly discuss uh, what a vapour barrier is by definition in a minute but basically that that's going to stop any vapour from moving so it's not a it's not a vapour retarder it's an it might in this case because this is an Australian slide it would in fact be a layer of foil uh, and then what the software allows us to do is to run these simulations and we typically run them for about five years so we can see the the clock going in um, very fast motion there we're, we're zipping through uh, time and we're letting the seasons play out as we've as we would have put into these models and we're just seeing what happens and we're seeing what happens across that whole section of the wall so you can see uh, reflected below each of these diagrams at the top in the same scale below are the different elements of that wall construction so this first part is all the concrete and then we have a, a section of the glass wall insulation, we've got the air gap, and then we've got the plasterboard. The, the red line at the top here um, is the temperature, and the, the, the shaded part shows us the, the range. So the, the actual line here is an instantaneous uh, point in time, but what we're really interested in is what's the range that occur oh, sorry what's the range that occurs over that given given period of our simulation um, because we want to see what the maximum is and what the minimum is over over that period so that's a really um, that's really useful because what it allows us to do is to see across that that whole cross section of the wall and see where we're going to get high levels of um, uh, sorry up the top I was explaining this is the temperature and then at the bottom we've got um, the moisture content and this is the moisture content is the blue line down the bottom and then the green is the relative humidity and it's important that we distinguish between um, the, the relative humidity which is temperature dependent, but the moisture content is the actual um, grams, or in this case, kilograms per cubic meter of water that is in that material. Um, so, for as a, as an example here, we can see that the concrete can actually hold a little bit of moisture. Um, fiberglass, on the other hand, doesn't hold much moisture at all, so our, our water sort of falls out of, the, of this layer um, but we can see that the the plaster can hold a small amount here once the simulation is done we can identify some areas of concern so concrete can be a reservoir for moisture because it's uh, pervious uh, on this case where we've got no foil we've got a high level of humidity over 80 percent occurring at the surface of the plasterboard. So this is likely, if we don't clean it off, to lead to the, uh, something similar to that picture where we saw mold growing on uh, the surface of that plasterboard there. At one time in our building evolution, and I'm sorry to say that it's still done uh, quite commonly in Australia, is that the thinking was, well, there's a simple solution to this because obviously moisture is coming in from the outside. We don't want a high humidity to be occurring on the inside. So let's put a, a barrier in here and to stop that moisture coming through. 
And on the right hand side, you can see that that's exactly what this foil has achieved. It's basically created a reservoir of moisture and we're getting this really high levels of relative humidity building up at the, at the inside layer of the glass wall insulation. So it's made our plasterboard drier. So you can see at the, at the surface here, it's below 80%. But what we've done is created this, this reservoir, this bigger, we've basically um, held up all the moisture at this point right behind the, uh, well, there's an air gap there, but it's behind the plasterboard and it's in the glass wall insulation. So we can, and that's getting right up to 100% humidity there. So we, we can assume that we're probably going to get actual liquid moisture forming in this situation and dripping down uh, on the inside of this wall. And all that's going to be invisible. In fact, this, this construction here is probably going to look better from inside the room because the internal surface is lower in relative humidity. Um, but what we can't see is what's causing the problem it's because it's inside the wall. Right, and this is the real power of Woofy because it allows us to predict this fairly accurately and realize problems before they get built. All right, now I talked about ASHRAE 160. I'm not going to go too much into that, partly because uh, I don't know as much about it as Jesse, and we do go into some of that detail during the, the training. Um, suffice to say that it's a great resource, as I said before, there's a lot of research gone into that, and we can use all that prior learning and knowledge um, for the both the New Zealand and the Australian context. And it allows us to look at various construction types. We can look at the resi um, resilience to rain penetration, and that's our E2 issues here in New Zealand, um, stopping moisture getting in from the outside, but also uh, looking at the impacts of uh, moisture on the inside as well. G mold growth indices are really interesting. Uh, because we can take, once we know the level of moisture that might accumulate, combined with how long that moisture might stick around for and different food sources, so different materials have different le different levels of, of cellulose material in them, we can predict how fast mould will grow under those conditions. So um, that allows us to um, do some other predictions about just how healthy or, or unhealthy uh, a particular construction might be. Uh, some exciting developments last year, the, and Jesse Clark was actually involved in a lot of the background work for this, is taking a lot of the that uh, ASHRAE 160 information and producing this DAO7 where, um, on behalf of ERA in Australia. Now, as part of Woofy training, you'll actually get a copy of DAO7, and it's you can essentially think of it as the implementation of the ASHRAE standard to uh, DAO7 is in is Australian, but it's also very very relevant and useful here in New Zealand as well. So some great work that's been done there, uh, and you will get a uh, that's another advantage of the Woofy training is getting access to that um, design application guide. All right, these are some slides that I prepared um, as part of just an overview of building science behind what, we're, what we mean when we're talking about um, some of the, the key metrics that we need to understand. If we step back and think about the, the thermal part, we're pretty familiar with that now we, we most people understand what R value is. It's resistance of the transfer of heat. We can measure that, we can predict it for um, most building materials. You can think of vapor permeance or vapor resistance as this as the equivalent of that, but rather than talking about the either the resistance or transfer of heat, 
we're talking about vapor. So we're not talking about liquid water here, we're talking about air molecules floating around in the air. And vapor resistance is measured in meganewton seconds per gram. And we can find that out for a particular material and, and give it a number. The inverse of resistance, just in the same way that R value, uh, the inverse of R value is the U value, um, the, the inverse of vapor resistance is vapor permeance. And you might think, why are those metrics uh, a little different? Well, there's um, that just the, the standard way of, of uh, assigning value to vapor permeance. It's micrograms over per Newton seconds, which also translates to uh, a Newton is a, a measure of pressure, which can, can be translated to uh, second me seconds meter squared pascals. Don't worry too much about this now. Um, this is just an example of the type of um, level that we go into during the training so that we understand things like SD value. So SD value is something that uh, gets quoted, we quote it for uh, things like uh, um, Proclimate Intello and Intello Plus. And it's one of the key metrics that's really important for measuring the flow of vapor through a material. We take that um, permeance and we make it equivalent to a thickness of air. So SD value is actually uh, is dimensionless, um, which is a little bit weird. We jump through a few um, mathematical hoops to to get to this SD value, but it does make it useful for then comparing different materials. <coughs> so in this context, mu here is the diffusion resistance factor. Uh, that's the dimensionless number and we can multiply that by the thickness so we get SD as just a straight um, linear metric or a, a length. In America uh, and around the world, you might see very strange um, numbers for some of these because there are imperial equivalents for uh, resistance and permeance, but they've tried to make it a little bit more um, simplified by having classes. So there are four classes of vapor control class classifications. Uh, class one and two are essentially a barrier. So thinking back to that construction with the foil in it, um, a foil would be considered pretty close to a class one because it, it it's like a, a similar to a plastic bag it's just it's not going to let any vapor one way or the other and then we have class three and class four increasingly um, permeable so the higher the class the the more permeable the membrane is so remember the vapor permeance is the inverse to vapor resistance So let's look at a few different materials. We'll start with insulation, loose fiberglass insulation has an SD value of 0.1. And we need to know the, the size of the material uh, in this instance. So that's just a, a 90 millimeter insulation bat. And then we start increasing. So if we've got the plasterboard, um, SD value of 0.12. See the permits there is uh, 0.6 meganewtons seconds per gram. And we keep going up a little bit further. Now the, this is a, a fiber cement sheet, uh, 0.13, slightly more resistive than uh, um, plasterboard bricks. And then we go up to PIR, we're getting up to SD values of 3.6, so we're getting um, higher resistance to the flow of vapor. Um, 
now you might think when I first saw this, I thought, oh, PIR, surely PIR is more resistive. Um, but look at the dimensions here. This is comparing a, a 100 millimeter EPS, so that's expanded polystyrene. Uh, it's the one with a little, looks like the balls all smushed together. Uh, has an SD value of six, um, but we are comparing it to just a 60 millimeter layer of PIR, which is is quite dense uh, at an SD value of 3.6. XPS is extruded polystyrene, 75 millimetres there, has an SD value of 15, so we're starting to get quite high now. But when we think, when we look at um, metal uh, and other um, more, uh, 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 much denser materials, now we're getting into the um, hundreds, so uh, over, over 200, uh, mega newtons, uh, actually, actually SD, I'm not sure why that's got a mega newton seconds per gram on it, it shouldn't do that. Um, so yeah, quite high high values, but not infinite. So some of these materials will actually allow vapour to go through at enough pressure. A few other examples here, uh, different, different types of concrete, um, Hebel as well. And then we come to membranes. So we can do this for lots and lots of uh, different materials, and you can see that um, a lot of materials have been measured. Now, the, the interesting thing with these uh, membranes is that they have been measured at some of them uh, multiple times at different relative humidities because some materials it isn't enough just to define a vapor permeance as one number we actually need to define a vapor permeance uh, curve or a vapor resistance curve and this is true particularly for our proclimate intello and intello plus because the Part of the secret of why Intello works the way it does to control moisture in both summer and winter is that the, the permeability, the vapour permeance, the vapour resistance of the Intello changes depending on the relative humidity that is surrounding it. So on the left hand side of the, the graph here we can see uh, at very, very low relative humidity Intello is quite resistive. It's uh, sort of at the mid, mid uh, to high, um, or should I say that's a low class two, uh, getting quite close to a class one. So it's very, very resistive to the flow of uh, vapor. As conditions get more humid, it actually opens up and allows more moisture to go through. And if you think back to that, slide with the the layer of foil you can you can imagine how that is really really useful because if you're starting to get really high levels of uh, relative humidity that surrounding that material then you don't want to be backing it up and creating that reservoir you want to be allowing the uh, humidity to diffuse through to avoid the accumulation of any liquid water and also to to minimize the the growth of uh, mold um, and you want the the same to happen when the season changes. You want the the vapor to be able to to flow through again. So that's um, that's all very well and and good. The question then arises: well, How how do you measure that? Because you, it's not like a piece of material where where you're measuring R value. You can stick a heat source on one side and uh, in in controlled conditions and and do a thermocouple and and figure out the R value you need to do a whole series of tests in wet cups and wet cups and dry cups. So in similar to how you um, measure relative humidity with a, with a wet cup, dry cup um, type um, thermometer, 
we've got to do a series of uh, calculations with some fairly it, it looks it is quite sophisticated um, but the the reason for that is because it's got to be very accurate and it's got to be repeatable the method for testing materials is to take a sample the potassium chloride uh, at the bottom there is uh, similar to the, the little sachets of uh, packets of stuff that says do not eat when you open up a um, something that has to be kept dry so that that just um, absorbs any excess uh, moisture and under very very controlled conditions uh, these samples are held at a particular um, humidity at a particular temperature uh, for a given period of time and then the, the the cup is weighed to determine how much moisture has transferred through the the sample so that ha once you do that for um, enough different set points you can create this curve and this is the uh, the vapor resistance curve um, remember I said that it can't be just one number you have to do um, the curve so that you find out what the resistance is at the whole range of relative humidities and that's just uh, an example of the, the climatic chamber and the testing, the, the testing facilities that are required in order to do this. Now part of showing these slides is to I guess underline the the importance of getting this this data and also to emphasize that it's not an, an easy thing to do um, we're on a bit of a campaign here in uh, New Zealand and also in Australia to get more and more products tested to find this data because it is product specific it does depend on the thickness of the material and that um, for things like OSB it can vary from different brands and it could even uh, vary from batch to batch. So the more products that we can get to go through this testing, the better because our modeling is only as good as our data. And we've got access to lots of data from equivalent products from around the world. But what we really need is to get more and more products, local products here uh, to be tested so that we can do accurate modeling uh, in Woofie. To do good woofy modeling, these are some of the um, this is some of the data that we need. So we need to know what happens to the water content at different relative humidities. Uh, again, not these are all um, these are mostly curves because these properties change under different conditions. So some materials will hold more water at, at different levels of relative humidity. Um, liquid transport coefficient is the second one there again dependent on the water content um, things like thermal conductivity now in this in concrete in this example the th thermal conductivity the one down on the, the bottom right here uh, is pretty constant with temperature but there are materials that where the thermal conductivity actually changes so the you know the R value could change relative to the temperature only changes a little bit but we need to know what impact that has because when we run these simulations it, it's dynamic so anything that changes one variable can then uh, influence those other variables over that time period that we're running the simulation for so once again uh, this this data is not necessarily easy to get but it is really really uh, important and the more data that we can get from various sources and, and product suppliers the better so that we can do better modeling this is Fraunhofer by the way uh, it's a institute in Germany well it's all around Germany there's different parts of, of Fraunhofer if you think of brands here in New Zealand or, or CSIRO in Australia um, multiply that or add a couple of zeros on the on the back of it you start to get um, an idea of the scale of uh, Fraunhofer. Um, we 
in our industry are mostly interested in the uh, the Building Physics Institute, uh, IBP, um, but there are 60 other institutes that look at a whole range of, of different uh, different sciences, some pretty amazing stuff that, that goes on. So um, this is, when we talk about Fraunhofer, this is, this is what we're talking about. Uh, I'm not sure when these numbers are from with a their budget of, of 30, the annual budget of 30 million euro, um, 350 staff. This is just the Institute of Building Physics that we're talking about. The you know the, the, the whole of Fraunhofer is, is a massive organisation. This might be uh, this might look a little bit familiar to anyone who's visited the Brands campus. Again, just on a on a much bigger scale, lots and lots of test huts. So they do lots of empirical testing to verify and calibrate uh, some of the, the modeling. And it's grown from uh, from these fairly modest uh, uh, historical photos to something quite extraordinary today. It's a, it's a massive institute. And uh, it's really fantastic, I think, that we've got access to this, this research. And we quite keep emphasizing that a lot of it is very relevant and transferable to the New Zealand and Australian context. It does need to be calibrated and we need to provide some uh, conditions, uh, particularly our climatic conditions, but also some of our, our specific materials and, and products, but the physics stays the same. That's an underlying theme, is the physics is the same so we can use this knowledge, we can use this learning and the years and years of experience. Uh, because bear in mind that uh, leaky buildings are not a new thing and they're not a, a unique problem to New Zealand or Australia. Very, very similar thing happened because what occurred in the 70s is that suddenly oil became expensive, people got concerned about the cost of energy, and we started wrapping up our buildings to to stop the heat from escaping it. As soon as we did that, we started finding moisture problems. And I'm not just talking about New Zealand here or Australia. You know, this happened across Europe, happened in America. Um, so we can take all that learning. A lot of people, industries have been down this path before. They know the issues, the complexities. As uh, we ask more of our buildings. To, to look after us on the inside, to shelter us from the, the weather. And we know how to fix it. We know how to uh, construct buildings so that we have the four control layers. We're, we're protecting from liquid moisture on the outside. We're protecting from vapor flows. We're protecting from heat flow. And we're protecting from um, air flow. We, can, we have the technologies to do all those. We have the experience to do them all. But we just need to understand that we, we can transfer a lot of that learning. And that's a, what a lot of the emphasis of bringing tools like Woofy to New Zealand and to Australia is to help transfer some of that knowledge and quantify it for our context. So saving energy increases the risk of moisture damages because we put in a thermal gradient there that wasn't there. If, if we had cold and leaky buildings, They'll stay dry, or they'll they allow to they'll get wet, but then they'll dry out fairly easily. Um, they'll be durable because they they get dry, um, but they'll be expensive to run, and that's what we we experienced. So we we didn't like that; it was uncomfortable. But when we add insulation, we add a a thermal gradient. So dealing with moisture is all about um, figuring out how to have that heat flow or reduce that heat flow, but also account for the moisture flow. So an assembly should only be as vapor tight as necessary, but as vapor permeable as possible. So we want to control the flow of, of vapor, water vapor, um, and we want it to be as open as possible to allow that vapor to flow, but uh, only to the level is uh, is desirable. So Woofy aims to take the guesswork out of that. Otherwise, we're just sort of holding our finger up in the air. Um, 
by running a bunch of simulations, we can find out exactly what the right level of permeability is and what, what the right or a sensible combination of products and materials so that we have those healthy, durable, comfortable conditions on the inside. Now, as I mentioned uh, at the start, there are a few different flavors of Woofy and you can go and have a look on the Woofy, the main Woofy website. Uh, you can actually download a uh, an example version of these. You can have a little bit of a, a play and, a, and a, a feel for for what's there. So they're, they're sort of locked down um, some of those those free versions, but it does give you a little bit of a sense of of what they're capable of doing. So most of our training is focused on uh, Woofy Pro, which is the first one here, and that does 90% of what we need to look at, which is that fairly basic um, heat and moisture flow through a standard um, wall or a floor or a, or a roof construction. Uh, Woofy 2D gets a bit more complicated um, if we're looking at uh, junctions, for example, or complicated areas around um, the, the intersection of, of windows or, or, or complicated facade systems. There are a few people in both Australia and New Zealand, uh, specialist engineers, facade engineers who who do this type of work, uh, and really only need to pull out Woofy when they're looking at a at a bespoke system that they haven't seen before, and they just they want to uh, do some quality assurance at design stage. Most of our work, like I said, can be most of what we want to know can be achieved just using the the Woofy Pro, uh, which those graphs that I that example that I showed you where it's looking through the a cross section of a of a wall in that instance we could also do a, a floor or a roof um, so Woofy Pro the the first level there um, covers most of what we need to do in the more advanced level there are things like Woofy Plus uh, it gets much more complicated there are also um, versions of Woofy that integrate with um, Passive House uh, US that's the fierce version of, of Passive House as opposed to the um, PHI that we're mostly familiar with um, and, and a bunch of other add-ons as well. So I've talked a little bit about the um, the the product the material properties that we need to look at when we're modeling the the wall the other thing that woofy needs uh, are the inputs from the outside and this is where the likes of brands and also Niwa here in New Zealand have been very helpful um, then there's equivalents in Australia where we've been able to provide the climate data for specific locations. So this is the boundary conditions on the outside. We need things like the rain, the driving rain, so it's not enough just to know the rainfall but we, we also need to know the wind speed and when those things occur together because rain very rarely falls down uh, vertically, particularly if you're in places like Wellington. It tends to flow in uh, different directions and it's it's that when uh, wind driven rain that we need to be uh, conscious of and then figuring out how much of that or trying to predict how much of that rain is actually going to penetrate through the cladding system and get into our wall and one of the things we talk about is that no cladding is waterproof um, it might start out being fairly waterproof but it's always going to allow a small amount of leakage we also need to know the uh, boundary conditions on the inside and, and there are some great ways inside the tool where you can model this for uh, different conditions, whether it's a, a heating only scheme or whether it's uh, a heating and air conditioning, um, particularly uh, more common to a commercial building. Um, uh, funnily enough, uh, the, the typical New Zealand homes are actually quite hard to model in Woofie because no one assumed that you'd run a house with um, with the very little heating that we do. We tend to very, very much underheat our houses and, and not condition them very well. Um, 
so the model kind of falls apart in, in, um, if you try and model houses uh, in, in typical uh, New Zealand conditions, but that's a little bit outside the scope of, of Woofy anyway. Um, if anything, it, it does emphasise the importance of, of having decent internal um, environment conditions. And as I mentioned, uh, we, we need to do some predictions on the amount of driving rain that will actually penetrate into the construction. So there are all the, all the boundary conditions. We need to know the material properties, we need to know the outside conditions, and we need to know the indoor conditions. Once we've got all that, um, we can run our models, uh, like I say, typically for five years, but it could be longer, it could be shorter, depending on um, uh, what we're wanting to do. And then we come up with these, these graphs so we can look at the moisture content, the humidity, and the temperature variations through that cross section and over a period of time. Um, and once we've done that analysis, we can find these danger zones. So in this particular instance, this is another a, a different build-up where we've got cement board uh, on the outside, and we've got a layer of insulation here um, and plasterboard on the inside. This is actually a model done in Melbourne, and we can see here that the, the danger zone is again on the inside of the, um, or sorry, sorry, on the outside, but it's still within the insulation layer. The insulation layer often tends to be at one, one extreme of the insulation layer, tends to be one of our points of um, concern because it's where we get these big changes in. in um, it's, it's where the gradient of, of temperature occurs uh, because that's the insulation doing its job. You can see on the top here that um, there's very little movement on the inside because insulation is doing its job. We get the temperature fluctuations occurring on the outside of the insulation layer. Um, so where we get this bigger gradient coupled with the, the flow of moisture is where we have uh, potential issues. But WUFI allows us to quantify those issues rather than just saying, oh, I think there's going to be there's you know potentially a problem here. We can actually say, well, how big is that problem going to be? So that's obviously really useful for uh, designers um, who want to get into the details of um, of those predict that prediction. Um, consultants, more and more, we're seeing people like building surveyors looking at you know, investigations figuring out was this a moisture issue from ingress from the outside or is it more likely to be caused from uh, vapor from the from the inside um, product companies we, we like I said we, we want more and more data from um, product companies and we'd like to think that it's in their interest to get their products tested so that we can plug them into the the library um, because we all know that if a product gets specified, it's much more likely to be purchased and then installed. And by having the data in the library, it gives designers and consultants much more confidence in being able to recommend those for specification. And then obviously construction companies could find Woofy modeling really, really useful if they want some assurance that the facade or the um, the building construction system is actually going to work and they're not going to find that they are, are facing issues with mold or, or sick people or, or things rotting um, it, within a fairly short period of time after the building's completed and I think we've probably covered um, or you can uh, you can kind of assume what the, the typical questions that, that might be asked by different people or from yourselves that Woofy can uh, um, that Woofy can be used to answer. Anything to do with the accumulation of moisture and the the, the negative impacts of that um, are potential use cases for for Woofy. Um, but I'm sure you can you can think of other questions that that you'd like to use uh, Woofy to solve. We have um, in New Zealand, there's a website, woofy.co.nz, which um, maintains a register of Woofy professionals. 
Um, this gets used by consultants who designers who, who are looking for someone else to provide modeling for them. And as a result of doing the um, the user course, so we run two levels of courses with the fundamentals, uh, which is one day of training, and then a user course, which is the second day. Um, anyone who goes through that second day, uh, they can request to be put onto this list. And we have an equivalent list in Australia as well, uh, woofy.com.au. Um, that gets updated from time to time. So it can be a, a great source of um, of extra work if you're wanting to get into the field of providing these services for other people, um, and or if you're a, just a designer looking for someone, you can use that to to find someone who's um, been trained and able to provide woofy modelling or hydrothermal modelling services. So that's that's pretty much it uh, that I wanted to cover in this hour. Uh, other than to say, for those that are interested in uh, doing the training, we have um, online training coming up on the 23rd of March, the fundamentals course. So this is this is one day. Um, so I'm pretty confident this will be going ahead, um, which is more than I can say for some of our other physical training at the moment. It's a little bit up in the air, but because this is this is online training, uh, we've, we are we are confident, providing we have um, enough people if it's only one or two people registered uh, then we'll delay to the next round um, but with with enough uh, with three or four people or more we will providing this we will be providing this training it's run by Jesse uh, out of Sydney um, and I usually uh, jump in and um, have a offer a bit of support as well what we usually do is provide uh, the training uh, two days uh, consecutively so that, that we find a lot of people want to come along to the fundamentals that's really useful to get a get your hands on the tool um, just to get familiar with it but for those that actually want to go on and learn more detail get some more practice and then to be able to start offering or do their own modeling in-house or or offering uh, woofy services to others then you definitely want to be doing the second day as well as the first day. So they they go together to become um, the the sort of the two day user training. But if you're wanting just to come along to the the first day uh, and get uh, an idea of the, the use of the tool, then that's also um, perfectly fine as well.